Hi, everybody. We've got another five minutes before we begin. I'm going to try sharing my screen to make sure that my uh, PowerPoint is working. And you all could help by giving me a thumbs up if you if you see it. Um, let's see. Let's see, share screens. Hopefully you all can sh see my slide right here that says my name. All right, looks like folks are, uh, it looks like that's working. Thanks everybody. So I'll stop the share and we'll let folks uh, keep coming in. So we had quite a few that um, registered for uh, the talk today. So excited to, um, to see who's actually able to, to make it. I mean, it's a beautiful day out on a Saturday. So I don't know uh, how many people want to want to be inside for this. Um, but uh, we all are also. Uh, oh, hi, Emily. How are you? Um, we are also recording this and it'll be available on YouTube. If you want to get a recording of it or any information on the cemeteries, um, put your email in the chat, because in some cases, if you get the link from outside of the Montpelier website, I won't have your email and the participants. So that would be uh, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Appreciate it. So, so, um, but yeah, like I said, we're we got a couple more um, minutes. Uh, you could get familiar with the um, the chat function. I'll try to um, keep keep up with that as uh, questions come in. Hi, Joanne. So glad to have you here. Um, and what we'll do is I'll try to look at the chat as I go with my talk, but probably just wait till the end to, to answer questions. Um, and, uh, oh, hi, Jane, how are you? Um, and I'm gonna mute my phone here. And I'm, Hoping everything will go all right here in the uh, the neighborhood. No one will start um, grinding stumps or start a major construction project. So, hello, Carissa. How are you? Glad you made it. But um, we're um, uh, just we're actually just wrapping up in the field um, at at Montpelier right now. We're going to be doing a um, the next, not this Wednesday's Lunch and Learn, but one of the later ones will do a tour of the site. But on the Friday Lives on Facebook this Friday, we're gonna be showing the Overseer's site and uh, talking about the, uh, the fines for, for, the, uh, for the season. So, but yeah, okay, we're up to 32 participants. So people are, are, are rolling in, which is great. So, have see see uh, a lot of friends here, um, a lot of folks uh, coming in, which is wonderful. So, and as you as you come in, like I said, get you can get familiar with the um, the functions of Zoom. Uh, I'm sure most of y'all are familiar with it by now. Uh, there's a, a chat box and also a question and answer box. The chat seems to be the easiest way to, um, to, to ask questions. And you can either direct them to me or to everybody. So however you want to do that. And like I said, as we, uh, I'll try to look at the questions as they come in and while I'm giving my presentation, uh, but sometimes this chat box gets minimized when I share screens. But definitely at the end, we'll, we can answer questions. But if I, if I happen to see them, I'll answer them as we, as we go. So, um, so yeah, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna, um, in a few minutes, I'll share my screen and begin the presentation, but we're gonna let uh, people keep on coming into the, uh, into the Zoom session. And I'm gonna get my carafe of water, I'll be right back. <laughs> But like I, I stated in my um, Facebook, excited to be doing this, and um, and it looks like it, it's one o'clock. So 
We will uh, go ahead and begin the, um, uh, the webinar on cemeteries. So welcome everybody. It's great to have uh, so many few people that have signed up for uh, the talk today on Montpelier Cemeteries. I'm Matt Reeves, Director of Archaeology and Landscape Restoration here at Montpelier. And I've uh, been here for just over uh, 20 years and uh, the cemeteries have had, held a a special place in, in my heart, uh, just from the sheer fact of being an archeologist, but for many reasons, uh, especially working with the, uh, with the descendant community, we've had been able to, there's been a lot of connections with the, with the cemeteries uh, for, for obvious reasons. But what, what we're gonna do today is, um, I'm gonna, uh, for most of the presentation, I'm gonna be sharing my screen and we'll um, be doing a PowerPoint and, I will have the, um, the, I'll try to have the chat box up and, uh, and watch it and uh, see what questions uh, come in. If I do miss questions at the end, I'm gonna go through the chat box and the question and answers and try to get to, uh, to all of them. But um, really uh, glad to have uh, so many uh, folks here today and I will go ahead and share my screen and let me know if you can see see the presentation here. Um, and we are, um, let me make sure, I'm gonna stop sharing for one second to make sure we're recording. Yes, we are recording. And like I stated before, um, I will send, I will send a, um, a copy of this presentation out to folks that have pre-registered and also information on the cemeteries. And if anybody is interested in any of the reports that I talk about during this or any, any additional information, put your email into the chat and I'll go ahead and capture that, that before I sign off because uh, with the regular Zoom webinars, I don't get everybody's email uh, who, who are on the session. So if you wanna get more information on the cemeteries, put your email in and I can send it to you. Or if you don't wanna do that, just send me an email, mreeves at montpelier.org and I can get you the information. So. But what, um, what we're gonna be talking about today is uh, cemeteries at Montpelier. And cemeteries hold a very special place in archeologists' heart, uh, you know, not just because they're in the ground. I mean, that's what archeologists do. We, we uh, um, do excavate uh, uh, our, our, our office, so to speak, is underground. That's where all our uh, subject matter is. But um, usually when we're excavating things, we're excavating people's trash. We're excavating buildings that they've demolished or buildings that have accidentally burned down. Um, we're, we're usually finding things that really weren't meant to be found. And with cemeteries, it's literally, cemeteries are a way for, for people to communicate with uh, their descendants. It's, it's when you if, you, if you choose to mark your grave, if you choose to say how you're gonna be buried, you're making a statement to the living. And so in many ways, uh, the, the cemeteries are a way that the dead can communicate with uh, the present today. And so as archeologists, we're pretty excited about that because it's not usually we find, we're working with uh, a, a subject matter where the dead are actually trying to communicate with us. And, and in this case it is. And uh, it, 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 at plantations, of course, you know, this is a very complicated um, issue because for most of the people that were at plantations like, like Montpelier, where you had over 100 enslaved individuals uh, at any one time that lived and worked at Montpelier and also passed away, it wasn't necessarily the case that they had full control over how they would be represented, you know, in their burials, but also on the surface, like how their cemeteries of their loved ones and how their cemeteries, how they would be buried themselves would be represented for the future. And this is something that definitely comes through with studying these sites archeologically. So what's really useful to do with any kind of study, especially at Montpelier, we're really fortunate to have four cemeteries at Montpelier and also in the surrounding area, many cemeteries for comparison. And so what I'm gonna to do today is we're gonna Oh, I'm gonna have us do a tour of the cemeteries at Montpelier for comparative purposes to see you know, how different groups 
buried their dead in Montpelier and how that reflects what other groups are doing. Because it says a lot about, um, you know, the different groups position in relationship to each other and in relationship to the power structure. So, um, you know, for Montpelier, as you all know, Montpelier is the, um, the home of, uh, of not just uh, James and Dolly Madison, uh, but also home to uh, over over 100 slaves at any one time, but over um, pro we're estimating that somewhere around 250 individuals who passed away and are buried at Montpelier, and that's just the Madison uh, the, the, uh, for those slaves that were owned by the Madisons. There's as we'll get into it, you'll see that there are other plantations that are on Montpelier land that were adjacent that weren't owned by the Madisons, but we also have those slave cemeteries present on the on the Montpelier property as well. So um, for, you know, for for the, the the space of Montpelier, usually what people think of when they come and visit Montpelier are the homes, you know, the, the restored uh, main house, um, the uh, the buildings that we've restored for the South Yard. Uh, these are the these are the spaces where most people when they visit they're they're seeing what what was here at the time. And what we've um, got at Montpelier, of course, is also many cemeteries. And one of the most visible cemeteries that's present for visitors, uh, at least, is the Madison Family Cemetery. Madison Family Cemetery is just uh, down the hill from the visitor center. When you're standing in the parking lot, you can see the brick wall at a distance. And what's most obvious is the obelisk, uh, James Madison's obelisk, which has a, has a whole topic of conversation in and of itself. And really understanding the, the, cemetery, the cemetery of the cemeteries of the enslaved Americans who were buried at Montpelier is really, and, and what's happened to them through time is really difficult to do without first starting with the Madison Family Cemetery and seeing how the Madison family really um, uh, presented their, themselves when they died and also they're they're dead to the public and this is the, the madisons of course have had the the luxury if you will of being determining determining for themselves how would they, how they would present themselves and how would they they would present their loved ones buried there for um almost uh 300 years since since 1732 when the first burial of a madison family member happened here at the Madison Family Cemetery, which was likely, most likely Ambrose Madison, who was um, uh, uh, murdered, assassinated, uh, killed by two, according to the court documents, two of uh, Francis Madison's slaves and a neighboring slave. And when he passed away in the, in the fall of 1732, we presume that he's buried in the Madison Family Cemetery, and that started the, uh, started the, started the cemetery. Now, what's most obvious about the Madison Family Cemetery is estimates that have been done by uh, Tom Shackman, who used to, to, to be an archaeologist at Montpelier and also a researcher. He wrote his thesis on the Madison Family Cemetery. He, is, he estimated there are somewhere around 100 Madison family members that are buried in the cemetery between 1732 up until the 1930s. And when you look at the marked graves, there's about 40 marked graves in the Madison Family Cemetery and then a whole bunch of empty space. So what it means is there's a lot of graves in the cemetery that aren't marked. And uh, early on, uh, excavations were done. This is back in 1999 and 2000 to look for some of these remains. And it was in, in, in anticipation of having to rebuild Madison's uh, obelisk. It was starting to fall over in the late 90s. And there was restoration and stabilization work that needed to be done. And one of the first areas that was opened up is right beside the obelisk. And what became apparent were two graves that right beside the, uh, this is the stone base for the monument here, that, um, were, that we were able to figure out who, who was buried there, or rather Tom Chapman was in his research. And we're, how, how this was able to be figured out is by the orientation of the graves. Um, we uh, presume just from family back burial patterns that the, uh, the Madison's parents would be buried close to where he was buried. And um, we know that the brick wall around the cemetery was built in uh, somewhere around 1810 based on the bricks in the mortar. And um, usually what would happen is when a brick wall was built around a cemetery, all the burials that happen after that wall is built 
typically are oriented with the walls because when when the enslaved uh, workers are in this space digging a grave shaft what they would do is orient the grave east west with the wall and so in this case this burial burial right here appears to have been dug the grave shaft after the wall was in place in uh 1811 while this grave was dug before we know that james madison senior father of the president dies in 1801 while his mother passes away in 1829. So this provides one clue. The other clue is with uh, Christian tradition of uh, Eve's, um, e uh, Adam giving his, uh, his, see his left rib to create uh, his wife. This is a burial practice where the wife is to the left of the husband. And so this follows as well. So we're thinking that we, you know, we found the graves of Nellie Conway Madison and James Madison Sr. And in further excavations, uh, you know, uh, one day we were thinking that, that the grandparents might be in this location. But in lieu of digging up the whole cemetery, we dug a trench through the cemetery. And what we found were a number of other unmarked graves that were present in this, in this location, some of which are oriented with the cemetery wall like these. So they date after 1811, while these others that are at an angle probably date to before the wall being put in place. So when you look at this, what it, what, it, what it indicated is there's a lot more burials. So we decided to do ground penetrating radar in the cemetery um, in around 2008. And what we found in that GPR was, is basically the Madison Family Cemetery is full. There, there are graves everywhere throughout this space, most of which are, are unmarked. And this pretty much confirmed Tom's suspicion that there, that there were over 100 graves. There were about 100, 100, 100 signals that were found in this uh, GPR. And what it, what it really indicated is that for when the vast majority of burials were happening up until about 1838, um, there were no markers for, uh, for folks being buried in the cemetery. And this includes children and adults. And in fact, when you look at the, the Madison Family Cemetery, if you were going to go back to what this looked like when Madison, right at the year after Madison was buried, it would have looked um, something like this. Because basically when Madison died in 1836, he was buried in an unmarked grave. And his grave was only marked some 20 years after his death when um, he, uh, when, when there were, it was about three owners after Dolly Madison sold the property, uh, one of the owners bought the property specifically to erect a monument to Mr. Madison. And when, when Madison dies in 1836, his wishes are clear that he wants to be buried at a, as a Madison family member. With, and how Madison family members are being uh, marked is by not being marked in the cemetery. So this shot right here, you know, again, here's what it looks like today. This is what it would have looked like in 1837. You know, the wall was present, but there are absolutely no markers in the cemetery. All the markers that are there today happen after 1836. In fact, the first marker, I believe, is from 1838, one of the uh, um, medicine's uh, nieces who's buried in, in the cemetery. So really what you've got with the, um, the cemetery is a, you know, today, it, it more reflects the uh, post-Madison ownership of Montpelier. Tom believed that you know, the Madison family members started marking graves in the cemetery specifically because the Madisons no longer lived there and they wanted to, since there was no, there wasn't gonna be an, a, a family connection with the cemetery with being living in the space, they wanted to mark graves so that people would remember where they were being buried and also uh, just to record where, where burials were. So um, when, you, uh, um, when you look at the cemetery today, you know, it, it really represents, uh, you know, you know a, a 200 of, um, of uh, memorialization. But what the cemetery also represents is a protected space. And this space is protected by this brick wall. And when we did the GPR survey, we had the GPR um, uh, uh, technicians do work uh, not only within the walls, but also outside the walls. And in scanning outside the walls, there were only two potential anomalies. They were pretty weak. They were outside the walls, but everything was contained within the cemetery. And so what we're thinking is that by 1811, um, uh, what um, would have happened is that 
by that time, Mount Pleasant is no longer being occupied. It's been abandoned for uh, since 1761 when Francis Madison, the grandmother, dies, Mount Pleasant being the original Madison family home. And the area around the cemetery begins to be plowed. And so what the, the family is probably worried about is the edges of the cemetery not being defined and potentially being plowed uh, you know, for the fields that are starting to be worked in this area. And uh, so much, Sheila asks, um, if the graves are not marked, how would they know where to dig new graves? That, that's a good question. I mean, it's apparent from some of the excavations we've done that graves often clipped each other, for example, in this case right here. But during the, um, during the Madison ownership, there's probably oral history. And there's a chance that the graves could have been marked by, uh, by uh, wooden stakes. Uh, you know, it, it was, you know, with the disturbance that ha that's happened in the cemetery over the years, it's really hard to know whether or not there were wooden markers in the, in the cemetery, but that potentially is the case. But definitely when the Madison sell the land, that's when they start marking the, uh, marking the graves. So with the, um, with the, but what really marks the cemetery though is this wall. And this is a really important, um, uh, important aspect to, to uh, recognize with the cemetery here, because uh, when you look at the slave cemetery, the absence of a wall was very significant, significant for what happened to the cemetery during, during the Madison ownership. So for the other cemeteries that we've got at Montpelier, we've got about three other cemeteries that we're gonna talk about today. There's the, uh, the slave cemetery that's just, uh, here's the Madison family cemetery right here. Slave cemetery is the star right here. We've got a, a, another potential slave cemetery in an area that's known as Tags Island, which is uh, in the 20th century, there are DuPont worker house that were, houses that were in this area. And I'll talk about how we're trying to figure out who, which plantation community we feel buried their dead at this cemetery. And then the final cemetery is the Gilmore family cemetery, which the Gilmores being uh, uh, a family who, who were former slaves of Madison who were freed after the Civil War and were able to buy property from the Madison family to create, to build a farm and then to have their own burial ground. For the slave cemetery, this, uh, the slave cemetery is one that we've known about for quite a long time. Um, since the, when, when the trust first acquired the property, what, there was a early surveys that happened in the mid eighties. And one of the sites that was, was first found was this area of depressions. This is a, a shot of the slave cemetery that I took back in 2002 after a snowstorm and the snow melted and the melting snow uh, was left, the unmelted snow was left in the grave depressions and really just made a wonderful shot to show where these depressions are located. And the topography in the area really helps you see, this is a, a 3D a scan of the, of the cemetery showing the depressions in the area. And then a lot of these depressions are marked by these um, uh, field stones, either quartz or greenstone field markers. What we don't have for the cemetery are any maps, nor do we have any oral history or written records talking about this being a slave cemetery. We've been able to figure out this is a slave cemetery based on you know, comparisons with other plantations. Early on, uh, you know, DuPont workers, when they, had, when they had seen this cemetery, they assumed it was from Civil War uh, soldiers camped at Montpelier. Uh, there were Confederate troops camped at Montpelier during the winter of 63 and 64. But in researching that history, there, the, um, when soldiers were sick, they would be uh, moved to hospitals in Gordonsville and Orange. And that's where all the burials happened during the Civil War. So this cemetery that we've got here is one that, you know, just looking at patterns of burials of enslaved Americans at other plantations that matches this, this pattern. And with the numbers that we've got here that I'll show in a second, it definitely is uh, size for, for, the, for, the, for the enslaved community. So the cemetery, um, for, for years, we marked the cemetery with a, a path coming in from um, uh, what's called known as Race Barn Road. And we assumed that the cemetery was confined to the area of depressions right in front of this sign right here. But um, about, uh, about 10 years ago, um, discussions with uh, DuPont workers, especially elderly DuPont workers, several folks recalled that when the field across from the slave cemetery, so the slave cemetery is inside the wood line right here. This is the old race barn road that we've now removed since discovering the size of the slave cemetery. 
Um, with what they were, what older DuPont workers were called is when this field was plowed um, outside of what we thought was a slave cemetery, that, um, and this was in the early 20th century, they were called human bones being encountered, long bones, uh, skulls that were, would be uh, bucked up by the plow um, in the early 20th century. And so we, in hearing this, what we decided to do is to do some investigations. And one of the first things we did is consult with um, uh, folks that have cadaver dogs. And the cadaver dogs are dogs that are trained to scent human remains and the oils from human remains um, have a distinctive uh, odor that the dogs can scent even you know, hundreds of years after a burial. And so we brought, we brought the, the, the dog trainers, brought their dogs out, put a grid over this area. And there were five dogs that scented three locations in the exact same place. And how these dogs would, would um, uh, mark the location is when they were being walked you know, across, this, the, across this area, if they scented something, one, one of them would pick up a ball that was around its neck, another one would sit down, but there were, there were three of them that marked five locations in the same location. And with that, that gave us a good indication that something was in this area. So we decided to do a preliminary GPR survey. We did one with J JMU and this, the, what GPR is, is ground penetrating radar and allows you to scan below the ground surface and see any disturbances. And where there's a grave shaft, that's a disturbance that would be picked up by this unit. And these, these indications, the, the, the survey indicated there were burials in this area. So what we did is in, uh, in during this whole process, we're consulting and working with the descendant community on this, both with the, the cadaver dog survey and the GPR survey, is that we met with the, the descendant uh, community. Um, the decision was made to clear some of the brush out from the woods of this area, and then conduct a survey over a, uh, a much larger, larger area. And this survey we did in uh, November of 2018 and February of 2019. And um, with this survey, what the surveyor did is he ran these lines every two and a half feet, the width of his sled. And when he would encounter um, a, a, a signal that matched up from one line to the other line, he would mark that as a potential burial. And so what this looked like, what the GPR signal looks like on the radar screen is basically if it's an undisturbed area, you have you know, a pretty uniform series of lines, but where there's a disturbance, like a, a grave shaft, you get these parabolic arcs that occur in the readout. And in, in doing this area, what he, was able to, what he was able to mark is all these discontinuities or anomalies that were in these areas. And where there are two that matched up between survey lines, he would mark that in his on his map as a potential burial. And so what became pretty clear is that the, this cemetery extended beyond uh, the, um, the, uh, um, the area of, of depressions. And when you look at this on a map, this is a, um, a LIDAR map of the cemetery. Here's, um, here's the, the, the uh, old um, race barn road that used to run through the middle of the cemetery. Here's the interpretive path that goes out to a sign. And this is the area of these red blobs. These are the outlines of the grave depressions that we've known about since the 1980s. These yellow dots are locations that Brian marked as potential anomalies of burials that matched up between survey lines. And what you notice is, is that these, these, these um, matched anomalies are confined to a, an ovoid area, uh, about, the, about, a, about an acre and a quarter in size. But in the area where the depressions are, these depressions we know are, are burials based on them being about six foot long depressions marked on either end by, um, by, by uh, field stones. But there's about 40 grave depressions that we're, you can see on the surface. He only found about 10 anomalies even in this area. And the problem with doing GPR, ground penetrating radar, in the um, in woods is that so many times what you'll get is anomalies that are related to tree roots, but then also where you have grave shafts, they tend to be in the clay very hard to hear. So usually grave shafts that potentially, and this is something we want to test with archaeology, grave shafts that show up the best are those graves that are dug deeper and maybe 
have a different soil that's been put back in. So this is something we need to look at with the archeology. span But what the GPR was giving us an indication of is the GPR was only finding about a quarter of the graves. So looking at how many graves, how many anomalies he found, which is about 50, we're estimating there's between about 200 and 250 burials in the area of the slave cemetery. And that matches with the number of expected deaths at Montpelier for enslaved Americans who were living and working at Montpelier from the 1730s up until about 1844, when we believe the slave cemetery stopped being used. Now, what you might ask is, you know, why don't these other areas where we have burials have depressions? And the clues from this came from the, um, uh, the area where these depressions are. If you look at where these depressions are on the, um, this is the area that we think is the, the, the extent of the, uh, the slave cemetery. When you look at this, at the area of the slave cemetery on a 1908 map, what's on the left here is the, um, is the uh, LIDAR imagery of the slave cemetery. On the right is this 1908 map that the DuPonts had drawn of the property where they show woodlots with these, the, these, these trees that outline where the woodlots are. Where you look at where this woodlot is in 1908, it, it basically matches up exactly where these grave depressions are. And when you look at this LIDAR map, what you'll notice is there's a berm it's a, this is a low circular berm that's in this area that appears very similar to the edge of a plowed field. So what we're thinking happened in the slave cemetery is that this area where these, um, these bur the burial shafts are defined where you have grave depressions, this is an area that's never been plowed and probably represents the latest set of burials at the slave cemetery. While the area that's outside of this area that was not plowed has all been plowed. And that's why this tree line shows up on the 1908 map. So going back to uh, this map right here, this area of grave depressions that's inside you know, this, this berm from plowing, we think is the latest area, the latest area of burials by, by enslaved um, uh, uh, Americans who were burying their dead here at Montpelier. So we're thinking this part of the, of the burial ground dates to the 18 teens, to the 1840s. And then the area that's outside of this, that's in, that's in, that was in Woodlot in the 1910 map is um, potentially a little bit earlier, maybe the 1780s to the 18 teens. And this corresponds when James Madison Jr. takes over the operation of the plantation and changes substantially the agricultural um, patterns on the plantation. And then this earlier, this other section that's in this plowed field dates to much earlier. And given the fact that in the 1920s, the plowing is disturbing burials, there's a good chance that there's a lot of soil that eroded from this area. And um, with the, uh, um, because usually when, when burials are made, you, you know, people bury their loved ones at least four feet deep so that they, they're out of the scent of animals, scavengers that might dig them up and disturb the burial. So um, if you think about these burials being about four feet deep, with there's potentially in some areas over a foot and a half to two feet of soil loss, and then that resulted in plowing later on, disturbing some of these earlier burials. And actually from the ground penetrating radar survey, there's indica indications of, of erosional slump in this area and these burials along the edge might have been the ones that are disturbed. But in working with the descendant community, what, the, what our plans are is in the, the very near future is to do excavations in the cemetery to simply identify some of the burial shafts to confirm the ground penetrating radar survey. And I'll, I'll get into this in a, in a few minutes, but also working with the descendant community on memorializing this space. And, um, and this, you know, so th this is the research end of the, of the slave cemetery, but putting it into um, context with, you know, what visitors see today, you can begin to see, you know, uh, you know that in terms of how the dead are being memorialized in, the, in these two spaces, it's very different from Madison Family Cemetery compared with the slave cemetery. So today when you when visitors walk down to the uh, Madison Family Cemetery, what they walk through is the old 
farm complex from Madison era, all this field in here. This is the visitor center right here where people park their cars. Madison Family Cemetery is here. And of course the slave cemetery is up here. And as um, when I see, uh, uh, see Tony, you asked the question, how does the GPR results compare to the five cadaver dog locations in the field? They, um, for that, the, the, they, they're not an exact match, Tony. And in talking to the folks doing with the cadaver dogs, the scent, the oils from human remains actually travel through the um, groundwater movement. So you don't always get an exact location of burial from where the scent is. And uh, James uh, French asks, um, hi James, how are you? Uh, was there any evidence of graves or human remains found when the road or paths were built? Um, and how was the slave cemetery first found? When, when we removed the road um, uh, in uh, two years ago, uh, th there was no evidence of any depressions or remains. We, we, we monitored the construction and actually stopped the removal of the, ro of the road um, when asphalt was removed, but left the gravel in place. Um, but when the road was built, I, uh, that we don't have anyone um, that I know of that was, that was alive still that was present for that, that happened in the 1930s. That probably the person that might've remembered that was Buck Smith. Um, and he's the one who ident initially identified this area as being an area where, you know, plowed, when it was plowed, human remains were found. And when the, when the path was put into the slave cemetery in the late 1990s, that was all put above ground. So it was built up off the, uh, off the ground surface. But for today, when visitors walk down to the, the Madison Family Cemetery, what they encounter is, you know, this, this, farmed, this farm, farmscape from the Madison era that we're interpreting today. And when they get to the Madison Family Cemetery, what they see is this very cleaned and dressed family cemetery that's distinctive from the surrounding environment. And this, this is how this landscape has been since 1811. So the Madison family were quite intentional, like we've been talking about, in terms of making sure that their burial ground was uh, contained within the brick walls. And ground penetrating radar has shown that to be true. There's only two potentially anomalies outside of the cemetery that might or might not be burials. But the, you know, the results from the GPR, so hundreds of burials all confined within the cemetery. Now, when you start walking over to the slave cemetery, what you encounter is, you know, today is you walk through a field that's, that's mown. And when you get to the slave cemetery, you encounter our interpretive sign that was put up in, the, um, in around 2005, along with, the, along with the path. But when you look around the slave cemetery, what you see is, an area of woods where burials are, and then, in, and then a field. And this probably is how this area looked even in 1811. We're thinking that as um, burials uh, shifted from this area over to this area, this area begins to be plowed. And so the same enslaved individuals who are building this brick wall, they're probably being assigned by the Madisons to plow, plow this field where they knew that their ancestors and their loved ones had been buried probably within their lifetime and within memory. So, you know, the treatment of the dead during, during the time of the Madisons was very different. And this speaks to, you know, um, you know really the continued uh, complete dehumanization of, uh, of, of enslaved Americans uh, during this period. And, and it's something that, you know, this is, this is a universal where, you know, you know, going back to, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, there's evidence for humans burying their dead and wanting to uh, have their, their um, ancestors uh, be buried, to have their loved ones be buried and be treated specifically. And the, 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 the very fact that the Madisons have built a wall around their cemetery while having slaves plow their 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 loved ones' graves really speaks a lot to, you know, Madison's view on slavery, on on uh, on the people he's enslaving as people, and so you know there there's many you know thoughts about Madison's uh, conflict of views on slavery, the how he's treating um, the 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 enslaved families here in this situation. You know, speaks volumes. You know, in another in another direction. So, this you know, not only does the, the the these do these cemeteries reflect how you know 
the, 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 in this case, the enslaved individuals are trying to bury their dead and represent them on the landscape, but also, also reflects how Madison is seeing the people he enslaved as well. So this is, in this landscape, what we're looking to do in the, in the very near future, working with the descendant community on memorializing this space. And uh, at the end of this talk, I'll get into what that process looks like and how we we're, we're working with the descendant community on this on this process. But it's something that you know we're critically aware of that you know what what needs to be represented in this space needs to take into consideration you know the descendants um, of uh, the people that are that are buried here. So reflecting you know on the slave cemetery, there's another cemetery at Montpelier that we believe is a uh, a cemetery for en enslaved Americans that is um, uh, outside of the visitor core. So here, this is an is a overall aerial map of Montpelier. Here's a center road coming up to the main house right here, the visitor centers in this location. Here's the slave cemetery. There's an another cemetery out in the woods that's outside of the visitor core that we know today as Tags Island Cemetery. And the reason why it's called Tags Island Cemetery is in the DuPont era, there is a uh, settlement of, of worker houses in this area called Tags Island. And um, in surveys that were carried out in the 80s and later surveys that we did in the early 2000s, we came across uh, what was evidently burials in this location. And um, where this burial ground is located is, is interestingly, but unfortunately, right on the edge of the Madison era patent. And in fact, when you look at the landscape, where the cemetery is, is on the other side of the patent line from the Madison land. And so we think that it's associated with the, the, with the, the, uh, the, the, uh, just the um, enslaved community that, it, that did not belong to the Madisons. And this is a, um, this deed right here is a deed that marks the edge of the Madison patent with later on the Smith family who owned Tetley, and I'll show a larger map of this in a second. But what's, what gets complicated in this area is during the, um, from 1780s up until, seven, uh, up until 1832, this land was owned by the Madison family. So whether or not there were individuals being buried in this location in the late 18th and early 19th century, you know, the, the time frame of this is gonna be, uh, need to be uh, looked at when we, when we begin to examine and do GPR survey of this area. But this is a, a map showing where these depressions are. This road trace comes around here. Um, there's about uh, about a dozen burials that we depressions that we found here. And when you look at this area, when we did a leaf rake survey, what you can see is this. This is a, a cluster of the four more obvious burials, which have um, headstones and footstones. So, you know, the exact age of these burials is is difficult to uh, um, uh, state. But, um, and um, I, I see there's a question here. Pam asks, um, uh, the view of Madison being instrumental in plowing this field, is that documented in his records? As the landowner would, uh, would that corner of the field necessarily be his decision? Did he manage in that detail paralleling this tragic decision? Yet, Pam, that's a question that, um, you know, we've uh, been able to ascertain from Madison's records, um, he you now we don't have the you know a doc document saying that he instructed his slaves to plow the exact location where the slave cemetery is today. He and his um, his father were very involved in um, all aspects of uh, of the of the organization of the farm, and have have very explicit directions that they wrote to their overseers. So this would have been something they would have been aware of, and and also there's enough traditions of slave cemeteries that are unplowed in the area that the, in, the, that the intent to plow the cemetery was you know, a choice of economy over, over you know, uh, respect for the dead. It's something that um, you know, is literally in the ground, if, if you will. So it's something that we're using to understand you know, everyone at Montpelier, both Madison and the, the enslaved Americans. Um, so, but for the cemetery here at Tags Island, again, we've got a lot of questions for this is, you know, um, whether or not this is a, um, a cemetery that dates to the Madison period. 
based on the number of graves we've got in the Madison family, in the, in the uh, slave cemetery at Montpelier, in the visitor core, we're thinking that that was the exclusive cemetery for Madison slaves. And there's a strong pattern of, of families burying it f among enslaved America, African Americans of burying their dead in one location. And if it's possible, continuing to do that through time. Now, what we know about this cemetery is that um, it is not accessible for descendants similar to the, to the slave cemetery. Once Matt, Dolly Madison sells the property, we're not sure whether or not uh, slaves at Montpelier who die are buried in that cemetery. They, they might well have been because there's, there's some evidence that there are some Madison slaves that do carry on or sold to the, to the next owner. And so that would have maintained that tradition. The compli complicated uh, issue we've got with the Tags Island Cemetery is it changes family hands a number of times but what we do know is that there's no evidence of burials in the post-emancipation era. And a comparison of this we can gain from uh, a local cemetery known as, uh, in, in the area called, called Jacksontown. Um, uh, this is a map of Montpelier. The Montpelier core is right here. This is where the visitor center in, is in, in the main house. Um, and just beside Montpelier is a land area known as Bloomfield. This is the old Bloomfield plantation that was owned by the Newman family in the late 18th and early 19th century. And who's pictured on the lower right here is, um, was a, a gentleman, Alan Jackson, who was born into slavery. He was born in this cabin that, that was um, in the, um, uh, uh, this, this photograph we obtained from the Jackson family. And that, that um, uh, um, uh, uh, slave quarter is located right where this red dot is with Bloomfield, the main house being located where my arrow is. Where the Jackson Town Cemetery is located is uh, a distance from the house where this yellow dot is. And today, the, the, the Jackson Town Cemetery is, a, is, a, is, a, is in a woodlot. And um, there, there's an area of graves that are unmarked, that are covered with covered in um, in uh, periwinkles, similar to the uh, slave cemetery at Montpelier, and there's there's um, uh, headstones and footstones that are that are field stones, and but immediately beside this area, and this is um, a picture that I took about 15 years ago, and this is um, I know it's 15 years ago because my children were quite small. This is uh, colon tests uh, from back in 2006. This is um, my kids for scale pointing out one of the, uh, the fieldstone markers up in this area, but just down from the hill where we, we presume the, there are slave burials of enslaved Americans are burials from the post-emancipation era. And this is a uh, burial of a gentleman by the name of uh, Pat Patrick Gunner. He died in uh, um, 19, uh, 1916. And just this morning, I, I actually found his death certificate um, uh, and what's interesting about uh, Patrick Gunner is that he is, is not a, he was not in, he was born in slavery, but he was not enslaved at the Bloomfield uh, on, uh, plantation. He was born in uh, Louisa. And what's unique about, the, about Bloomfield is that Im immediately after emancipation, there are a number of families that bought land from the Newman family and in this plot right here, what you can see is some of these plots. This is a blow up. This plot right here is a blow up of this area where the Jackson Town Cemetery is. And what you can see, this is the current tax map, is there's a plot of land where the cemetery is that's owned, it's listed as being owned as by the Jackson Town community. It's listed as the Jackson Town Cemetery. And in oral history that we've done with um, uh, Jackson Town community members and descendants of uh, the Newman family at Bloomfield, that plantation house is right here. They recall this cemetery being used as a slave cemetery when Bloomfield was active. And so what you've got with the Jackson Town Cemetery is a former slave cemetery that continues to be used by descendants into the early 20th century was one of the last marked burials being from the 1940s that we've been able to see in the cemetery. In the case of the area of Montpelier, say um, with uh, um, the um, cemetery that we call Tags Island, 
uh, which was owned uh, as part of Tetley Plantation. Tetley Main House is up here off of Liberty Mills Road, and then later owned by uh, the great nephew of James Madison, Dr. James A. Madison. Um, this is um, uh, his house that was later occupied by the Washington family up until about 2005, is that the, the cemetery here and also the, the slave cemetery are basically landlocked and descendants of you know, freed slaves and descendants of, the, of those slaves were not, did not have access to these areas after emancipation. But at J the Jacksontown Cemetery, there was access. So that, and, and, and then literally the descendants bought this cemetery from the Newman family later on. That's why this cemetery continues to be used. So, you know, what we've got evidence for with the Jacksontown Cemetery is the ability for the black community to continue to be able to honor and protect their dead. And the, and the fact that, you know, you asked a good question, Pam, about, you know, how do we, how are we able to figure out a lot of this? We figure out this from doing comparative analysis. I mean, so much of what we know about these cemeteries isn't recorded in documents. In the case of the, the, the slave cemetery at Montpelier and also the, the Tags Island Cemetery, these two stars right here, the, because of what happened with slavery, with you know, the enslaved Americans being sold you know, a, a, you know, by the 1840s and the case of Tetley Plantation, potentially being sold off in the 1780s, there's no family connection with these cemeteries. There's no oral history. You know, there's no li living relatives that have oral history talking about these cemeteries. And that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a loss that you know, is just um, you know, absolutely representative of what happens with chattel slavery in this country is you know, not only is there a loss of memory, there is a complete loss of family connections. When people were sold into the deep South, those people were never seen again. Those memories of the landscape left with that. And in some cases, we've been very lucky to have oral histories that survive and some documents that survive. Usually these, the, the memories of the land are soon forgotten after people pass away. And this is where, you know, even more recently, um, we've got a, a cemetery that I wanna talk about next, which is post-emancipation, where the memory of the cemetery literally almost got lost. It could have been lost within a period of five years if a descendant, uh, Rebecca Gilmore Coleman, had not talked to her um, older relatives. Now, the, the next cemetery I wanna talk about is the Gilmore Family Cemetery. The Gilmores were able to buy a plot of land from Dr. Madison. This is this yellow plot right here around 1880. That's when they first mortgaged this property. And so the lower right here is the Gilmore cabin. And to, to give you a, a, bigger, a bigger map here, this is the Gilmore property, what the Gilmores bought from Dr. James A. Madison. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the, oh, in Leontini, yes, you said, oh, baby archaeologists are adorable. Yeah, that picture of Tess is just my favorite picture in the world. That is, uh, I'll tell you about the story of that sometime in Leontini. But with, with the Gilmore Family Cemetery, this is an example of, you know, a, uh, um, of a family. The jo George and Polly Gilmore were, based on an oral history of the Gilmore family, were enslaved by the Madisons. Um, they uh, either remain in the area after Dolly Madison sells the property in 1844 or after eman emancipation come back to the area because of connections they remembered. And what they do shortly after emancipation in the, in the 1860s, by, 18, by 1866, they have worked with doc Dr. James A. Madison, who owned this land here, to obtain a mortgage for this 16-acre plot of land. And not only do they build a, a build a cabin, but from analysis we've done of maps from the 1930s and aerial photographs, is they had a, had a farm where they had some areas that were in fields, some areas in pasture and orchards, but then woodlots. And then within one of those woodlots, they located as the reserve for their family cemetery. And in this area, what we um, what we're able to to locate is you know, grave depressions. And in this case, the two graves that are visible um, as grave depressions are George Gilmore and Polly Gilmore. And the reason where we know about this is because of, of, uh, um, of oral history that 
George and Polly Gilmore's um, great granddaughter collected in the 1980s. Um, uh, Rebecca Gilmore Coleman, who's a, 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 a local resident and des descendant of the Gilmores, she started looking at her family history in the 1980s. And uh, it was uh, shortly after Roots was there that her father told her about the Gilmore cabin and then also told her that uh, his grandparents, Rebecca's great grandparents were buried on the family land. Shortly after that, her father passed and Rebecca, you'll have to tell me if I've gotten this right, is shortly after her uh, father passed, one of her aunts took her out to the cemetery and told her the story, showed her the location of the um, of uh, um, her grandparents, Rebecca's great grandparents, and told the story of why there was a piece of angle iron in this location, and why George George Gilmore has a headstone and a footstone, while Polly doesn't. What what um, her uh, father and her aunt told her is that um, after Polly died, the Gilmores had their bed positioned at their grave, and this is a um, is a uh, tradition that is it, that is is uh, has precedence among other African American families where you know uh, a loved one's favorite item would be placed at the cemetery. In this case, this favorite item appears to have been you know their iron bedstead that they purchased after emancipation, and you know was was as part of the uh, the cabin. That bedstead is missing today, unfortunately. Um, it's gone from the cemetery, but the grave depressions are quite noticeable in this location. And again, how we you know George. Gilmore dies first in 19, uh, 1905, and then um, uh, Polly Gilmore dies in 1907. So this, you know, it pairs with the oral history that Rebecca was able to collect. So with the Gilmore family cemetery, though, we had questions. We know that from the census records, there's uh, two or three children the Gilmores had that passed away um, either in childbirth or in early childhood. And then also Rebecca, you know, and her family has been trying to place some, some relatives who they don't know where they're buried, especially Rebecca's grandfather, Philip Gilmore. He moved to Pittsburgh, but it's not known whether he's buried in the cemetery. So when we did the GPR survey for the, um, the slave cemetery, we also worked with the same GPR technician to do the survey of the Gilmore family cemetery. And in the in process of doing this survey, you can see the Gilmore cabinet through the woods in the background here. What the technician was able to locate using similar techniques is about, um, uh, about uh, eight burials in the Gilmore family cemetery. The, the Gilmore, Gilmore's, Gilmore's grave was located. This is a picture of, um, of uh, Brian showing Rebecca Gilmore Coleman the results of the scans over Rebecca's great grandparents, Polly and George Gilmore. So this is really the first time that Rebecca, you know, saw this signal, you know, of, of showing her her ancestors' burial. And um, what uh, there's the potential of being, you know, similar to the slave cemetery, more burials in this in this area. And these these, however, are much more recent burials. These are burials that probably started, you know, some in the 1880s, 1890s, but went into potentially the 1920s. And what happened with the Gilmore family land, the reason why the Gilmores were no longer able to bury their loved ones at the cemetery is the Gilmores lost their land in a court case with, um, in 1920 to the DuPont family. And the, the, um, the, the land went into, um, when George and Polly uh, Gilmore died in um, the early 20th century, they had not made out a will. And so to settle the, the, the land division, the judge decided to sell the land at auction. And uh, William DuPont by 1920 had the Gilmore land surrounded by his own land and bought that land at auction in 1920. And this prevented the Gilmores from burying any more of their loved ones here at the cemetery. So this was, you know, um, a, a lot, obviously a loss for the Gilmore family. And what's really tragic about this is that the memory of this cemetery was almost lost because if Rebecca Gilmore Coleman had not talked to her father about this, because this is an incredible, incredible, painful part of their family history, there wasn't a lot of a lot talked about in terms of the early family history at the farm. There's the possibility that this cemetery, you know, while it could have been identified archaeologically, and we could have had an idea that it was the Gilmores, we would not have the, the same history that we've got. And this, you know, how today we've got the Gilmore Family Cemetery marked is we have a path that leads between the uh, the train station 
and uh, uh, over to Civil War encampments and then over to the Gilmore Farm where we tell the story of the post-emancipation era. But when we found the Gilmore Family Cemetery and we started doing research on the Gilmores, we started also looking at other nearby um, families and cemeteries. That's when we started researching the Jacksontown Family Cemetery. But it's evident that you know throughout Orange County, there are these same family cemeteries, you know, dating to the early, late 19th, early 20th century that are out there, that in some cases have been lost because of family either losing the land or African Americans moving from the area because of you know this lack of economic opportunities in Orange County, and in some cases because of you know absolute harassment in the early 20th century. There are cases of African American families literally being run off their land, their homes being burned, and um, uh, in other cases, uh, families leaving the area, moving to 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 the industrial north in the um, the Great Migration that happened throughout the throughout the South. In this case, this is um, Deacon uh, Prince Jones showed me where his great where his grandparents were buried. This is around Tibbstown. Um, uh, another uh, local gentleman, George Long. This is over in the east, eastern part of Orange at Lahore. Showed me where his family was was, was buried. There's another case of a, one of the descendants here at Montpelier, uh, James, who's on the the, the call right now. Uh, recently showed me his family cemetery uh, at Brownland, and this is the Brown family cemetery. And in this case, with the Brown family cemetery, while the Brown family owns their land today, so they continue to use this family cemetery, the land that, where the cemetery was was lost by the family family uh, in the 1930s with VDOT putting, a, putting modern day Route 33 through the middle of their land and the family home being separated from the cemetery by this highway. And then where the, where the cemetery is today, they lost that land uh, and it's you know something they they've they continue to keep up, but it's no longer in the family. So the 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 history of these cemeteries is one in which you know it 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 is it is a complete mirror for the struggles that enslaved Africans and Black Americans have had in the region and all over the United States throughout the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. And, you know, the, the, the history of these, these cemeteries, you know, being in areas that are, that un, that are unmarked, that are often have been desecrated by plowing, um, that are, uh, and then when you compare this to, you know, cemeteries that have been commemorated, you know, from the beginning, like the Madison Family Cemetery, the, you know, the, 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 the difference in ability uh, that, our, 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 you know, the, the, our, our system of laws that uh, allowed people to be enslaved, allowed uh, one group of people to treat another group of people completely as animals is absolutely evident in, you know, the, the burial practices uh, and the post, the, the, uh, the, the, the treatment of burial areas um, uh, throughout time. And one thing that we're looking at with these um, cemeteries is you know being at a presidential home site, we want to you know look for restorative justice. We want to you know involve the descendant community in the commemoration of these spaces. So, for example, with the Madison Family Cemetery, the Madison family has been able to freely commemorate their space since 1732, and, it, and by law they've been they they've been able to protect this cemetery even when. It wasn't in their in their in their family's uh, um, hands legally anymore in terms of land ownership. These other cemeteries are not. And one thing we are especially looking for, towards with the with this, with a slave cemetery, um, uh, just within the visitor core, is working with the descendant community on how to commemorate this space. And this gets into a document that um, that we're working with. We about a year and a half ago, we um, held a, uh, a workshop with descendants. We held it with other um, other institutions that interpret African American history and have and work with their with the descendants that are connected with the, with the institutions they work with. And what we established was what's called a rubric of best practices for working with descendant communities. And this was literally inspired by the beginnings of looking to commemorate the slave cemetery at Montpelier, because when we commemorate these spaces, you know, and, and what we do is we're representing 
not just the ancestors that are buried there, but also the people that are that that, that um, the descendants of those uh, uh, folks that are buried in that space. And what the rubric is designed to do is really allow institutions like Montpelier to understand uh, how their interaction with descendant communities is progressing. So this is, you know, it's what what we're looking for with with this rubric is, you know, parity and communication, both in terms of the research we're doing, both in, ter in terms of the interpretation that we do. So in the case of the slave cemetery, the research is the ground penetrating radar, any excavations we do, that we do this in full consultation with the descendant community. For interpretation, you know, how we represent that space on the landscape, doing that with the descendant community, but then also making sure that in decision-making, in you know, sharing that decision-making power, we do that with in, in step with the community. And so this rubric is designed to you know, grade institutions on how they're doing. And it goes from unsatisfactory to exemplary. And as uh, Dr. Michael Blakey, who is a, a member of the descendant community and was a, you know, one, one, of the, uh, one of the participants in writing the rubric that um, we came up with, he stressed that this rubric, this this you know uh, this um, uh, this ability, way to judge how we're doing with this is meant to be aspirational and always improving, and you know in many ways um, you know we we need to look at how we're representing the dead at Montpelier, especially the enslaved Americans who were buried at Montpelier and, and, and sacrificed their lives for, for our country in everything we do. And even, you know, it's not just, you know, in how we are, you know, commemorating these spaces, but also everything that we do that's connected with it. I mean, even, you know, the presentation uh, that I've done today is one where I'm talking about my research, but what I'm, what I'm talking about is, the, ens the enslaved Americans that are buried in this space. And so what I'm doing in my presentation today is I'm, I'm representing not just my research and my views, but I'm representing, you know, in how I present the people that are buried at the cemetery, I'm representing their lives, but then also representing the lives of descendants of the people that are buried at Montpelier. And in many ways, you know, in looking at the rubric and seeing how I've done this presentation, I can see where I've slipped, where in, in doing this presentation, while I invited descendants to take part in listening to this uh, presentation, I did not work with descendants in terms of asking whether this presentation should be done and then review the presentation before I presented it to the world like I'm doing it right now. So in many ways, you know, everything that we do at Montpelier we want to, you know, aspire to work in in collaboration, in tandem with the descendant community because it's absolutely critical. Because we're not just talking about ourselves, like me myself in this presentation. I'm representing uh, descendants' ancestors, and in many ways, representing who they are. So it's really critical to have, you know, conversations about this. So, um, uh, let's see, um, well. Just I'm I'm at the end of my presentation now, and I see Lynn French has a uh, has a question. Um, okay, the Brown family did not lose the land across the road where the cemetery is located. It was in fact sold during my childhood. I think the 1950s, but not sure. And the family retains the right to bury family members there as well as to access it. We maintain the cemetery. Yes, uh, thank you, Miss French. This is you know an example of where you know this presentation. I would have been much better if I had gone over it with the folks that I'm representing in this presentation. So in this case, what, what I was stating about that the land was lost in the 1930s is not correct. It was in the 1950s and the maintenance of the cemetery is done by the, by, uh, by the, by the uh, French family uh, for, their, for their, their ancestors. So um, we can open this up to, uh, to, to more questions, but I did want to end with you know, talking about the philosophy that we're engaged in right now at Montpelier with, you know, representing these spaces. Because, you know, as I began with, what cemeteries are designed to do is they're not necessarily for the dead, they're for the living. And in more particular, they're for the families of, you know, the deceased. And in this case, with the slave cemetery, we were very fortunate to have 
contact with descendants of you know the enslaved Americans who lived and worked at Montpelier, and working with the descendants is is the is the only way to tell these stories because we're telling their family stories and reflecting who who they are. So um, I will open this up for uh, for questions. Let me check to see if we've got any questions in the uh, on, uh, in the uh, Q and A. I see um, there's a question here. It was a little bit earlier by Sean. With not having any, there any written or oral history about these graves, is it possible they could date back before the Madisons, meaning potentially Native American? Uh, Sean, we have considered that. Um, it's just with the plantations here in the Virginia Piedmont, literally every inch of this ground has been plowed. And so definitely the grave depressions date to a, a later period. And, but the, you know, within these areas, I mean, there is a possibility that where the, the slave cemetery is, that there, it could have began as a Native American burial area. But the only thing with that is in the late woodland, um, how Native Americans are burying their dead is in mounds. Um, and this is, this land was occupied by the Manahoac. And we've actually, there have been mounds located um, on the Rapidan River near larger settlements. The, the Native American settlements during the late woodland up through the contact period were in these riverine environments like along the Rapidan River. So it's, there, it's likely that these are exclusively historic burial sites, but it, it's a good question. Um, Tony asks, uh, how does GPR, how do the GPR results compare to the five, oh, you, I, you already asked that, this was in another one. So, um, well, uh, let's see, and, and I've gone a, uh, a full hour here. Let me um, see if there's any other, any other questions. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen here, but um, really appreciate y'all being, you know, part of this, uh, part of this today. We'll give a few more uh, minutes. Um, uh, Tony says, um, you know, great presentation. Um, Oh yeah, sad and humbling as well. Thanks for your sensitivity on this matter regarding the enslaved community and making us aware. Yeah, this this is something uh, you know the, the research we're doing and, and the work with the, we're doing with the descendant community is one that um, we're trying to have full parity with the descendant community on these issues, and it's one that we're all learning from. Learning from you know not only in terms of you know what the the family history is like. Uh, Mrs. French correcting me uh, about the the front, the, uh, the history at Brownland Cemetery, but also you know ways in which to represent uh, these spaces. Um, and in working with the descendant community, what they here at Montpelier, what they've expressed an interest in is to have the space of the slave cemetery be one uh, not just for their families, but for any individual that has descendancy from the African diaspora here in the United States. So make this a space of contemplation for, you know, much larger group of people. Um, so uh, this is, you know, in, 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 in terms of working with the descendants and sharing, um, you know, a, a place at the table in terms of the research, the interpretation, it's something that is, um, is relatively is relatively recent, and we're what we're trying to do at Montpelier is institutionalize this. You know, we have institutional racism that is with has been with us for over three hundred years, and is literally written into the Constitution. Please come visit Montpelier. We we have tours that talk about this, but it's written into you know literally our country's DNA and in, in our in our upbringing. So it's something that you know we have to be very intentional about breaking and. You know that when I before I, you know, signed on for this presentation, I realized you know where I'd slipped in even you know doing this presentation without consulting with the community and representing their ancestors and who who they are uh, without you know a, a conversation happening. This is, I mean, it's all it's just conversations. That's what it needs to be. And uh, um, with those conversations, we can come you know meet meet each other where we're at and avoid misunderstandings, which is really important for this topic that's so incredibly painful. We don't need to do research and interpretation today and create more problems because we don't communicate with each other. And by respecting each other and respecting each individual as having 
you know, a place to, to talk about these issues. And, you know, it's evident with the cemeteries that, you know, obviously the descendants of a place in discussing, you know, how this space would be researched and, and commemorated. But when you look at Montpelier as a whole, it's something we want to do for all 2,650 acres because there, there literally isn't an inch of land that wasn't worked by enslaved Americans that benefited the Madisons, that allowed Madisons, to, the uh, James Madison to do what he did in terms of developing our constitution to pursue his political career. So, you know, the very essence of our government was dependent on, the, on Madison being able to enslave people. And that was, you know, it's something that is, um, makes Montpelier really gives us an opportunity to have this be a, con con a, a contemplative space. Um, Leontini, uh, uh, hey Leontini, who's a descendant, um, thanks for your, the presentation. Our memorialization committee will be discussing this important issue once COVID-19 is under better control. It's good to know about the other surrounding cemeteries. This will help us to develop a more comprehensive plan to commemorate our ancestors. Yeah, thank you, Leontini. I really appreciate uh, you being on the uh, on the call today. So, um, well, what I'll do is I'm recording this presentation and I can make this available to everybody. So again, if anybody wants to know more about the, um, about the slave cemetery at Montpelier, I can send you uh, links to our website and also a link to this, uh, this recording in case you wanna uh, share it with family or friends. You can put your, your email in the chat or you can just email me directly, emberuse at montpelier.org. Um, and I see, uh, yeah, good, wonderful having you here, Larry. Thanks for, uh, for signing on. So, uh, but, um, well, thank you everybody. I see Tammy, good to see you. Uh, thank you for the, for the great job, Matt. Hope to see you soon, but, um, I hope that all of you all are, uh, are safe and, um, we look forward to talking with you all again soon. So take care everybody. Bye-bye. I think I get everything. All right. Bye, Tammy. Bye, Tony. Bye, Sean.